Witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie. To co, to, co jest dla nas ważne i to, co jest ważne dla nauczycieli, ponieważ my jako, jako Pearson cały czas się rozwijamy, staramy się dla Państwa ulepszać i udoskonalać nasze materiały. Przeprowadzona została, przeprowadzona została ankieta wśród nauczycieli korzystających z naszego kursu Focus. 90% z Państwa, którzy korzystają z naszej publikacji jest zadowolonych z wyboru tego materiału. Jakie są powody, dla których Państwo lubią nasz kurs? Po pierwsze, zawiera dobre przygotowanie do matury. Po drugie, jest bogaty w treści i zadania, które są różnorodne. Chwalą Państwo kurs Focus za właściwy zakres słownictwa, za ciekawe teksty oraz za filmy BBC i za, te, i za filmy komunikacyjne. Dobrą informacją również jest to, że ponad 95% Państwa, którzy wybrali nasz drugi kurs High Note, jest również bardzo zadowolonych z z tego, naszego, z tego naszego kursu, który jest zupełnie absolutną nowością na rynku. To, za co Państwo lubią Hajnota, to przede wszystkim dobre przygotowanie do matury, również różnorodność treści i zadań, właściwy zakres słownictwa, ciekawe teksty oraz filmy wideo. Proszę Państwa, Fokus jest Częścią, jest serią pięciopodręcznikową. W tym roku do Fokusa 1, 2 i 3 dołącza starszy brat, czyli Fokus 4, starszy w sensie poziomu. Za rok, w 2021 roku, w Państwa ręce trafi piąta część podręcznika Fokus. W tym roku High Note wzbogaci się, wzbogaci się o jednego brata młodszego poziomowo i jednego brata starszego poziomowo, a mianowicie o poziom pierwszy i, i poziom czwarty. Poziom piąty um, urodzi się w 2021 roku. Um, to, co w tej chwili jest um, dla nas bardzo ważne, w obliczu sytuacji, w której przy, przyszło nam funkcjonować przez najbliższe dwa tygodnie, to to, co oddaliśmy do Państwa dyspozycji wraz z początkiem września, natomiast w tej chwili może mieć kluczowe znaczenie, kluczowe znaczenie dla procesu nauczania. Na pewno Państwo wiedzą o tym, że dołączyliśmy do książki nauczyciela, kod, który znajdują, znajdą Państwo po wewnętrznej stronie głównej okładki. Ten kod to jest dostęp do Pearson English Portal, na którym znajdą Państwo Presentation Tool i ćwiczenia dla nauczyciela oraz online practice dla ucznia. Presentation Tool to nic innego jak oprogramowanie do tablicy interaktywnej, które można wykorzystać zarówno online, jak i, jak i offline. Tak jak Państwo tutaj widzą, wszystkie ćwiczenia, większość ćwiczeń jest interaktywna. Te, które widzą Państwo na obecnym slajdzie oznaczone gwiazdką, to są wszystko ćwiczenia w formie, w formie interaktywnej. Także bardzo, bardzo polecam Państwu to narzędzie. Można je w jakiś sposób udostępnić uczniom i próbować z nimi pracować, pracować zdalnie. Zawiera ono również Interaktywny zeszyt, interaktywny zeszyt ćwiczeń, jak również cały pakiet innych materiałów, takich jak testy, audio, wideo, materiały do kopiowania, 
dyktanda, pakiet do mediacji, które są takim, tak, taką nowością, jeśli chodzi o typ zadań egzaminacyjnych. Life skills, które, które stanowią jedną z części podstawy programowej. No i do Państwa dyspozycji jest również książka nauczyciela i gramat gramatyczne prezentacje. Te gramatyczne prezentacje to jest rzecz, do której bar bardzo Państwa zachęcam. Znajdują się w nich, znajdują się w nich różne, różne materiały gramatyczne. Nie wszyscy z Państwa o tym wiedzą, stąd bardzo serdeczna prośba do tych wszystkich, którzy mają, którzy są, no, uczą z naszych podręczników, ażeby zajrzeli Państwo do tych gramatycznych prezentacji, ponieważ jest to, jest to narzędzie, które bardzo ułatwi Państwu pracę gramatyczną. Zachęcamy również do korzystania z dyktant, bo jak teraz jeździliśmy, do, do dzisiaj w zasadzie do wczoraj jeździliśmy, odwiedzaliśmy Państwa w szkołach, nie, nie pamiętali Państwo o tym, że te dyktanda są dostępne, a myślę, że jest to bardzo sympatyczna forma, którą można uzupełnić, uzupełnić lekcje. W ramach naszych narzędzi online'owych mamy również dla Państwa My English Lab, czyli zadania, które mogą Państwo zadać uczniom na platformie My English Lab. W większości są to zadania zamknięte, stąd łatwo jest, łatwo jest, znaczy w zasadzie Państwo ich nie sprawdzają, sprawdza je system, ale jest to łatwy sposób na to, żeby, żeby uczeń dostał szybką informację zwrotną dotyczącą tego, czy dobrze wykonał dane zadanie. W tych online homework, do których uczniowie mają kody dostępu w swoich zeszytach ćwiczeń, są następujące, są następujące typy zadań. Słownictwo, tak jak Państwo widzą na tym slajdzie, jest też gramatyka. Mamy zadania typu open close. Mamy zadania na czytanie, jak również zadania na słuchanie. Dodatkowo uczniowie w swoim, jakby w swojej części mogą również oglądać filmy, które są dla nich dostępne właśnie w online homework. Filmy BBC, filmy komunikacyjne, no i filmy gramat gramatyczne. Oprócz tego w serii Focus mamy vlogi. Bardzo serdecznie zachęcamy do uczniów przede wszystkim do tego, żeby, żeby z nich korzystali. Proszę Państwa, nasi nauczyciele bardzo cenią sobie książki, podręczniki, z których, z których korzystają. I teraz przekażę Państwu kilka zdań, które podzielę się z Państwem zdaniami, informacjami, które uzyskaliśmy od naszych, od naszych nauczycieli. Mnóstwo zasobów interaktywnych pozwala rozbudzać zainteresowanie uczniów i motywować do nauki. Nauczyciele mogą indywidualizować naukę. Wszystko jest przydatne i łatwo dostępne w czasie lekcji. Presentation Tool jest świetnym narzędziem do równoległego prowadzenia lekcji oraz wyświetlania wyników pracy uczniów. No przede wszystkim to, co, co Państwo potrzebują, znajduje się w jednym miejscu. A przy zadaniach na słuchanie 
nie ma konieczności korzystania z płyt. Wystarczy kliknąć i nie marnujemy czasu. To są zdania Państwa na temat wykorzystania naszego narzędzia Pearson English Portal. Zachęcamy Państwa również do tego, aby wzięli Państwo udział w sesjach, które nagraliśmy dla Państwa, a dotyczą pracy i wykorzystania Pearson English Portal. Wszystko znajduje się na naszej stronie, więc serdecznie zachęcamy Państwa do tego, aby w tym czasie trudnym w, w, w zasobach znajdujących się na naszej stronie internetowej. Aby uprzedzić Państwa pytania dotyczące tego, w jaki sposób obecnie pracować z uczniami, chcemy Państwa poinformować, że niebawem w uczniowskim edesku udostępnimy materiały z książek i ćwiczeń na czas kwarantanny. Zatem będą uczniowie mogli wykorzystać, wykorzystać te materiały razem z Państwem. Nawet jeśli książki zostawili w szkole, będą mieli dostęp do tych materiałów online. Kolejna rzecz, o której chciałabym Państwu dzisiaj opowiedzieć bardzo krótko, to repetytorium maturalne które w tym roku szkolnym udostępniliśmy dla Państwa ze specjalnym dodatkiem egzaminacyjnym. Zarówno repetytorium rozszerzone, jak i repetytorium podstawowe zostało połączone z taką broszurą, która nazywa się Testy Maturalne i w nich znajdują się trzy zupełnie nowe arkusze na poziomie podstawowym i trzy zupełnie nowe arkusze z poziomem rozszerzonym. Jak Państwo wiedzą, obudowa metodyczna to jest obudowa naprawdę mistrzostka. Podręcznik nauczyciela zawiera podręcznik ucznia z nadpisanymi odpowiedziami, zeszyt ćwiczeń z nadpisanymi odpowiedziami, około 50 arkuszy do kopiowania do każdego poziomu, klas CD, DVD-ROM, no i oczywiście kod dostępu do Pearson English Portal. A na Pearson English Portal dodatek, który, który uważamy za kolejne, kolejne mistrzowski i bardzo przydatne w pracy codziennej, czyli oprogramowanie do tablicy interaktywnej, tak zwane Presentation Tool. Nowością w tym roku jest również narzędzie, które w zasadzie trochę wyprzedziło sytuację, z którą spotykamy się dzisiaj, a mianowicie Live Classes. Zachęcamy Państwa do udziału w tym wyjątkowym projekcie, projekcie doskonalenia kompetencji językowych, które nazywamy, nazywamy Live Classes. Projekt ten jest dostępny dla, dla wszystkich nauczycieli szkół średnich. Na czym ten projekt polega? Każda klasa jest prowadzona na żywo, online, przez doświadczonego nauczyciela języka angielskiego i gromadzi jednocześnie kilka klas uczniów z całego świata. Dzięki Live Classes uczniowie mają szansę wejść do dynamicznej klasy globalnej, spotkać uczniów z innych krajów, a nauczyciele mogą zdobyć doświadczenie w nauczaniu, nowe, zdobyć nowe pomysły i inspiracje na to, co ewentualnie zmienić, wprowadzić w swoim warsztacie pracy. 
aby pomóc Państwu wybrać najlepszą klasę odpowiadającą wiekowi i umiejętnościom językowym uczniów, oferujemy dwa rodzaje lekcji na, na różnych poziomach. Proponujemy lekcje oparte na kursie Focus Second Edition oraz do, dodatkowe lekcje oparte na autentycznych materiałach wideo z BBC, które zapewniają wgląd w tematy związane z kulturą krajów anglojęzycznych. Także podsumowując, jest to projekt doskonalenia kompetencji językowych dostępny dla nauczycieli szkół średnich i do wyboru dwa rodzaje lekcji na różnych poziomach zaawansowania, oparte o fokus lub oparte o, materi na mater o, o materiały BBC. Wszystkich nauczycieli szkół średnich zapraszamy wiosną na webinaria dotyczące sposobów, sposobów aktywizacji nastoletniego ucznia, kształtowania ich umiejętności i efektywnej nauki. Szczegółowe informacje pojawią się niebawem na profilu Pearsona i serdecznie również zachęcamy do tego, ażeby Państwo śledzili naszą, naszą stronę na Facebooku, na w zasadzie fanpage. A zatem ostatnia informacja, zapraszamy do grupy Panaceum na liceum, które jest grupą specjalnie utworzoną dla nauczycieli, nauczycieli szkół średnich. Zatem będą Państwo również dostawali takie informacje na mail. Zanim przejdziemy do prezentacji WONA, chciałabym jeszcze przekazać Państwu informację dotyczącą takich praktycznych rzeczy. Będą Państwo mogli wydrukować sobie certyfikat poświadczający, że Państwo uczestniczyli w naszym dzisiejszym webinarium. Te, te certyfikaty otrzymają Państwo mailem, natomiast, natomiast materiały, które no, teoretycznie rozdawalibyśmy dzisiaj Państwu w, w, podczas, podczas na, naszego spotkania, będą Państwo mogli odebrać w, w, różnych, w różnych miejscach, o których też będziemy Państwa informowali mailem. Głównie będą Państwo mogli się wybrać do współpracujących z nami księgań. Zapraszam teraz wszystkich na sesję Bona Jonesa. Right. Hello everybody. So, um, my name is Vaughan Jones. And I'm one half of the uh, writing partnership, along with my partner, writing partner, Sue Kay, of the Focus series. And we're very proud uh, to have been writing this series. Uh, its first edition was quite successful, and we're hoping that the second edition will be as successful, if not more successful. Um, so that's... Uh, what I'm basing my talk on, the material uh, and a particular feature of FOCUS. So, the title of my um, session today, Focus on Personalization Without Getting Personal, it's really, uh, for me, I have three objectives. Um, one of them is to really explain why personalization is such an important theme or an important building block, if you like, for the course and the materials that we've written and how it runs through the course, all of the units, uh, all of the lessons, all of the exercises, like a kind of thread and pulls it all together. Um, so I want to obviously discuss and explain that. Uh, my second objective is I want to hopefully um, uh, give you some practical ideas uh, that you can go away with and use in your classrooms. Um, and thirdly, uh, I want to illustrate what I'm saying with material and show you material from um, the Focus series. I'm extremely proud of this uh, book, which has just come out, uh, the Focus 4 level. Um, in fact, I only got this uh, three days ago, 
And so um, uh, that is the uh, book where, where I'll be drawing on for most of the illustration of, of the points that I'm making. Now, the next thing is going to be very interesting because um, it's normally an activity I would do with you live, but let's have a go at it so you see uh, what happens. I would like you, uh, and I don't know where you are, you may be at home, you may be in a staff room, you may be um, sitting in the kitchen, I've no idea, but I would like you to reflect on uh, your language learning career as a learner. And I would, uh, in fact, I've got a photograph here to cast you back to when you were at school. Now, maybe I've misjudged the photograph slightly. Um, I've gone back a little bit too far in time. Uh, but this was, of course, a magnificent period when teachers were teachers and students were terrified. Um, but it's hopefully evocative in some ways and taking you back to when you were a student and in particular a language learner. And what I want you to do is I want you to clear your head of everything you have in there and I want you to bring to mind the best ever language teacher that you've had. It could be an English teacher, it might be a French teacher, it might be a Polish teacher, it might be a Russian teacher. Um, hopefully you can think of at least one language teacher, but if it's not a language teacher, then a maths teacher or a geography teacher. A teacher who has been really important to you in your career as a student, maybe at primary school, more probably at secondary school, uh, maybe at university. So just think of one standout teacher. Hopefully you've all thought of one. And this is what I would be doing in the classroom. I would ask the students about six, seven or eight questions. And I would tell them, don't write anything. Don't say anything. Just answer the questions in your head. So I'm going to do that with you. And I'm going to ask the sort of questions I would ask to evoke the memory of this particular teacher. So what was the name of your best ever language teacher? What language did they teach? How old were you or what year were you in? Now try and remember the classroom where you were taught. What was it like? Was it big, small, airy, smelly? Try to remember other people in the class. Who sat behind you? Who sat in front of you? And now focus on the teacher. What did the teacher look like? What did he or she typically wear? The sorts of clothes. Try to remember where the teacher stood in the classroom. Any particular mannerisms the teacher had. Did they always have a particular routine? And if you had to sum up succinctly why this particular teacher was so good, what would you say? What was particularly special about this teacher? Okay, so those would be the sort of questions I would ask. It kind of forms a framework. Um, and at this point, I would ask you to turn to the person next to you and one of you talk about your favorite teacher and the other person look interested. However, clearly that's not going to happen today. 
But um, it was interesting in the sessions I had in Wrocław, in Katowice and Poznan, um, and some of the adjectives that came out for that last question about talking about what a good teacher does were things like empathetic, inspiring, fun, kind. Maybe you could write a few in the uh, question box. Any adjectives that you that came to mind when you were thinking about your favorite teacher? Has anybody got any ideas? Maybe not. Oh yes, energetic, that was a good one. And motivating, absolutely, yes. And we had also um, patient, that was a really important one. And um, teachers also, um, students also appreciate somebody who's prepared and who um, knows their subject. So it was quite interesting. And um, this is uh, an example of what I would call a long term. That is to say, an extended speaking activity where students are put in a position to speak at length about something. Now, at length means maybe for two minutes, three minutes, or even four minutes. Um, talking about a particular subject. It might be a story, it might be a description of somebody, it might be a description of a place. Uh, and this is this long term is obviously based on personal memory or personal experience. So I would contend that in terms of personalization, it's quite easy to think of situations where we can get the students to speak at length about something that comes from their experience and therefore is, is personalized. It's much more difficult to do something, so that's kind of one end of the spectrum. It's much more difficult to do something where the language is much more controlled. So the controlled um, practice part of the lesson, where language is limited to maybe one or two particular structures. And that's something which um, we also think is, is, is better if personalization is involved. So let me give you another example, another uh, activity um, at that end of the scale. Here I'm going to give you a dictation. Now, I don't know if you'll do this dictation, I rather suspect you won't, but I will do it as if it were a dictation. I would ask you to write the sentences down. I'm going to dictate five sentences and I would ask you to, dicta uh, to write them down um, and uh, in complete silence. Now, clearly, I can't control whether you're doing that, but I'll do it anyway. So this would be the idea. Number one, my name is Vaughan. It means little one in ancient Welsh. My name is Vaughan. It means little one in ancient Welsh. Now, okay, I'm not going to continue with the dictation because it's rather silly in that sense, uh, doing it at, um, at distance like this. But that would be my first uh, sentence. My second sentence would be, I was born in Nottingham in 1960. I've been a teacher for more than 35 years. My fourth sentence would be, I'm feeling a little nervous today. And my fifth sentence would be, if I wasn't or if I weren't here, depending how grammatically correct you want to be, although frankly both are acceptable, if I wasn't here, if I weren't here, I'd be talking to you live in a conference room rather than sitting in an office in the in Pearson <laughs> offices in Warsaw. So I would do that as a dictation. And at the end of that uh, dictation, five seemingly random sentences, um, with your teacher hat on, with your uh, uh, and analyzing this in terms of language, what language point might I be wanting to practice here? Looking at these sentences, are there any particular um, language points that, that shout to you here? And the language points is looking at the ones 
in black, really, the language which is in black. Somebody said hello, hello. <laughs> well, I think we had a variety of answers in, in previous sessions. Um, what I've used this for before is a quick revision of tenses. If you look uh, here, you can see the present tense, um, you can see the past tense, in fact, a passive past tense, you can see the present perfect, the present continuous, and in fact, we even have a second conditional. So it's a way of pre uh, presenting, whoops, it's a way of presenting um, or revising maybe some tenses. It could also be a way of looking at the verb to be and how it is used uh, as an auxiliary and how it is used as a main verb. It's not difficult for teachers to find language points to teach with a chunk of English. And the chunk could be a song, it could be five random sentences, it could be a piece of text. It's easy to home in on something to teach. So that's fine. And always uh, in this kind of more controlled uh, stage of a lesson, we would want to be focusing on a language point. But we would also want, uh, I contend, to be thinking about meaning as well. And in this case, what I would ask the students to do in the second phase, having checked that they've got the English and having identified the tenses maybe, I would then say, right, go back to these sentences and make the sentences true for you. So, instead of my name is Vaughan, my name is, let's have somebody here, Pavel, or Beata, or uh, uh, Magdalena. Okay, Beata again. So you would change the information, but you would keep the structure of the sentences. So my name is Beata. It means, I have no idea what it means. Um, I was born in the place in 1960, etc., etc. cetera. So you would make the, the language which is in red, you would make it into um, your own, you would put in your own information. And then suddenly you are communicating, you are making those sentences meaningful. So you're still looking at the same language point, but you're practicing it for a second time and you are actually uh, converting something that was true for me to make it true for you. So it's a simple idea, and I'm sure many of you have used this before, but it is a way of making what is quite controlled language practice into something meaningful through personalization. So um, we've looked at two activities there, one which is at the free end of speaking, um, where students are asked to speak at length about something, and one is at the much more controlled end of speaking, where students have a very controlled environment, very limited language, and yet still we can make it personalized and we can make it meaningful. This is really what I'm looking at, and I have a sort of agenda here to continue uh, with the, um, oops, I don't know what I've done there, that's wrong, there we are. Um, by the way, this is a, a, a Matura classroom in Szczecin, I think, if that's correct pronunciation. Uh, beautiful students here, timid, nervous, waiting for their exam paper. Uh, we love them and we're trying to prepare things for them. And what I want to do, um, therefore, for the rest of the session is to look at personalization uh, in, in a broader context of learning and teaching languages in general. I then want to um, discuss, look at the advantages. Clearly, I think there are advantages. I mean, I'm a fully paid up member of the personalization club, uh, but there are challenges and there are some disadvantages and there are some negativity. So I want to look at those. And then I want to give you some examples, uh, tasks, activities, and exercises, particularly from, from focus. So that's how we're going to continue with the session. Now, the next slide, I'll just give you uh, 25.4 seconds to look at it. It perfectly sums up my feelings about teaching and learning. And I'm hoping that um, you are 
agreeing with that and, and have a wry smile on your face. Um, I think, as I said before, it sums up uh, perfectly my thoughts about teaching and learning. And that is to say that there is a very loose correlation between what we teach and what the students actually learn. Um, students learn at a different speed from the speed at which we teach. They learn in a different order from the order in which we teach. Sometimes we teach things over and over and over again and they never learn it. And sometimes they learn things that we haven't taught. So, as we say in English, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And similarly, you can lead a student to the second conditional, but you can't make them use it correctly. And believe me, I've tried everything, including electric shock treatment. Just joking. But if there is any learning to take place, then uh, it's, it's my view and the view of my, my co-author, Sue, and this is, in a sense, the foundation uh, stones of focus. It's important that we attend to three different things, three different areas. One is motivation, one is memory, and one is meaning. So what we call the three M's. Motivation, we need to engage our students. Memory, we need to pay attention to this and to engineer repeat exposures to language. And meaning, as much as possible, we need to put students in situations where they are saying meaningful things rather than just parroting things which mean nothing to them, or in fact, untruths, as we will look at later on. Now, how does, how does personalization help in this goal to pay attention to these three M's? Well, I think very substantially. Um, I've taken here the personalization definition as uh, is, is written by Scott Thorne, a very simple definition. When you personalize language, you use it to talk about your knowledge, experience, and feelings. And that's very, very, very true of the motivational aspect, because it seems to me that in the classroom, I'm not the most important person, although I am very important. My book isn't necessarily the most important thing, although it's a wonderful book, but it's my students who are the people who I need to base my lesson on. It's what they bring into the classroom, their thoughts, their ideas, their feelings, their experiences, maybe their expertise. That is what I need to focus on. That is what I need to draw out in terms of raw material. And I think if I can do that, then I can motivate them. So motivation in terms of personalization, and that's the way we often can do it, not the only way, but it's often the way we can do it. It's relevant to the students. It's of interest to the students. And I've found over and over that it helps um, achieve a kind of sense of solidarity in the class and an element of trust between the students. So when they're talking about themselves, they are making the classroom a better place. And that really helps with, with, um, with learning. We'll go in, into that in a bit more detail in a minute. In terms of memory, there's quite a lot of research which suggests that you learn better and you remember better when you reference things to yourself rather than to others. Uh, I have a, a quote here, which I write out, but I'll read it from some research done by Farzad Sharifian, who is a professor uh, in, in California. Free recall of linguistic items is superior when those items have been processed with reference to self rather than others. So there's plenty of research backing this up. And it makes sense because the second point here, cognitive depth, that is what is happening. When you refer, when you learn something and you learn it in the context of your own life and you somehow um, connect it to something personal, you are going further than doing what um, a lot of learning is, which is a kind of superficial level learning. You are, um, if, 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 if we agree, and I'm not a scientist, but I do know that uh, your chances of remembering things and learning things are vastly enhanced the more um, uh, neurological links, the more neurological connections you can make in your brain. If you are referring um, to self while you're learning things, then those uh, neurological connections, those synaptic uh, linkages are bound to be greater and therefore you're more likely to, to keep things in your mind. 
The other thing which is great with personalization is that there's an, always an element of surprise. You suddenly find out something, even students, and I've had this many, many times, students who've known each other forever since they went to primary school together, they suddenly find out something which they didn't know about their uh, about their, um, their their classmate and that can uh, be really interesting and very memorable um, and lastly in terms of meaning well obviously talking about yourself it's rooted in reality um, there's there's no um, no question about that so this all really belongs and personalization is very very linked to uh, the humanistic approach which is an approach to learning languages which i wholeheartedly endorse um, and uh, uh, one thing I'd, I'd be very happy if people called focus a, a humanistic approach because it very much is and this really is thinking about um, the idea that learning is not just an intellectual process but it is a whole person thing Okay, um, um, so you know we need to be thinking about human beings in general and not just uh, uh, sort of limit ourselves to being language learners. A couple of quotes here um, for for your for your information, both emphasising the same thing. That's Leo van Leer and possibly the granddaddy of the humanistic approach, Earl Stevick. I don't know if you've come across his material before, but he said this. And I think this is borne out by, um, obviously I haven't had reaction from you, um, but from all the sessions that I've done so far in Poland where that, um, memory of the best ever language teacher was often associated with a really good feeling in the classroom and where classrooms work and where there is a, a, a dynamic which is very positive very uh, supportive um, very enthusiastic this is where um, most learning happens and this is what um, the the humanistic um, uh, gurus shall we say um, endorse and, and feel strongly about um, you you can't it, it you, the situation in the classroom is absolutely vital uh, and the kind of atmosphere which is created will help or hinder um, language learning accordingly. However, there are challenges with this humanistic approach and in particular with um, uh, personalization. Um, and I'd like to consider three challenges which, uh, which I've tried to um, overcome in the years that I've been teaching in this way. The first one um, kind of comes from this um, in a way. We have, a, as teachers, um, we have a sort of um, uh, way of often listening to the students and only bothering about how they say something rather than what they say. And uh, if we're getting them to talk about themselves, which is what personalization is all about, you need to be listening to what they say and not only how they say it. Obviously, we would love them to be able to craft beautiful sentences, but sometimes they don't. And um, what, what they do say is important to them. And so if you're not listening to what they're saying, but just saying, no, no, it's the present perfect, not the present simple, or something like that, then, um, the students are going to feel uh, uh, shortchanged um, and maybe they're going to uh, be, be, be turned off. I have a, a, an interesting story which I'll tell you um, quickly now, uh, which illustrates this point very well, I think. Um, now, this was uh, a teacher who uh, went into class and wanted to um, do the lesson, you know, we always have a unit on health. OK, so they started off the lesson by saying, um, right, have any of you in the classroom ever had an accident? Which is maybe not necessarily the best way of starting a lesson. But anyway, that's what they did. Have any of you ever had an accident? So there was a kind of silence in the classroom. And then one student put their hand up at the back and said, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, last year, uh, uh, last year I break my leg and the 
teacher said, break. And the student said, yes, yes, uh, last year, uh, a terrible accident. Uh, I, I, I break my leg. Break. And the student said, yes, yes, last year, a terrible car accident. I, I broke my leg in three places. And the teacher said, good. Okay. So um, hopefully that rang home. The teacher only worried about the way that the, teach, that the student had, had um, delivered the message rather than what they were actually saying. Anyway, that's one thing to bear in mind when you are uh, thinking about personalization. Uh, the second more obvious thing is what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. So imagine that you were given this exercise to do. Okay, I'm going to give you 15.3 seconds to do this exercise. Now, get into pairs and ask each other the questions. I don't think so. I don't think so. So, obviously, teachers have to be sensitive to what is possible, what is permissible in the class, and what isn't permissible in the class. We are not um, psychotherapists, okay? We're teachers, we're language teachers, and by all means use personalization, but know the limits and know how far your students are willing to go, know which topics they are willing to talk about and which topics are, are going to be have to be treated in a, in, in a more sensitive way. This is really, really important. But there's no hard and fast rules and people get very exercised about this. I think it's just absolute common sense. You are the teacher, you know your students, you know how far you can go, how much personalization you can use, um, and so it's up to you to do that. And by the way, clearly with this particular exercise, um, you would not be asking your students to ask each other the questions, but there is a way of personalizing it, and here it is. So here, rather than getting the students to actually ask each other the questions, which would be completely not a good idea, you're getting them in groups and you're saying, right, these questions, in what circumstances might it be possible to ask them? Maybe when you're at the doctor or in the hospital or whenever. Okay, so there is a way of personalizing it by changing the second task. Okay. The third challenge, shall we say, um, with personalization is when you have a class who've been together for a long time and they know a lot of stuff about each other. And so if you're asking them um, to uh, talk about where they live, they already know where they live and that's not what we want to be doing. So if you're using this type of technique where you're getting the students to make the sentence true or um, for each other or something like that, then you can just change it slightly and maybe they have five sentences, four of them they make true and one they make false. And then the other student has to decide which is the false statement. So there are various ways you can play with the idea of personalization when the students are very familiar with each other and know a lot about each other. All right, but in my view, clearly, the advantages very, very much outweigh the disadvantages. Now, I'd like to go back to the first um, task which I set you, which was the long term, and I asked you to talk about um, the best teacher you'd ever had. Uh, and I'd just like to go through the um, building blocks for that because it's important. There is a sort of pedagogy, there is a methodology behind it um, and a way in which uh, it will work and won't work. So the first thing you need to do is to choose a topic that you're sure all of your students can talk about. That's really important and that involves knowing your students 
and um, knowing what they come into the classroom with. So whereas you can um, imagine that all of them have been to primary school, you can't imagine that all of them have been abroad. Maybe half of the class has been abroad and the other half hasn't. So don't get them to try and talk about the last time they went abroad because it might only apply to three people. So it's important and it seems simple, but it's really important to know your students and to choose a topic which you know they could speak about because it's part of their life experience. The second stage is to allow sufficient preparation time. This is really important. The students, you can't just bounce into the classroom and expect the students, I couldn't come in and say, right, I want you to talk about your favorite language teacher ever, go. Okay, it's unlikely they will be able to immediately remember that teacher. Um, they need some time to think about it. So the way I did it, which is to ask uh, some questions, is one way of doing it. Maybe you could give the, the students um, some questions in, in written form, but you need to be able to access their memory bank. You also need to be able to give the students, of course, um, the language that they will need or probably need. You need to anticipate. So if, for example, they're talking about um, the last wedding they went to, you need to be able to give them uh, language which would be suitable for talking about weddings, such as groom, bride, uh, sorry, bridegroom, groom, um, divorce papers, etc. Uh, just joking. But um, <laughs> you, you, uh, you, 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 you need to prepare them in, in that way because they may well be a specific vocabulary set which would be useful for them. Uh, and it's good to pre-teach that. Um, thirdly, you need to monitor the students and give them feedback. It's very difficult to get around all the students. Probably you can only do two couples, two, two pairs, um, but that's important. And you need to give them the opportunity to listen to somebody to do it like a model. And the best model, of course, is yourself, the teacher. Uh, because they would be certainly interested in your best ever teacher or your uh, wedding that you went to. And last but not least, um, give the students the chance to repeat the same long term with a new partner at regular intervals. This is very, very important. And it seems it's sometimes difficult to do because students are often resistance, resistant to doing the same thing twice. So, you know, you get them the week after you've talked about that wedding and you say, right, get into pairs and talk about the wedding again. And we did that last week. But you can do it. You should do it. Of course, not to the same partner. Have I ever told you about my Uncle Bill's wedding? Yes, 10 times. Uh, we don't want that. OK, but what we do want is for the students to have an opportunity to do the long term again. The benefits of that, I cannot exaggerate. The students improve in terms of accuracy, they improve in terms of fluency, and they move to a different level of complexity. They try more difficult language. It works every time, and it's a fantastic thing to introduce into your teaching. Um, obviously, we have lessons which do this, I've just put this one here, the um, a speaking lesson, which is in level four. In this particular case, we're talking about a memorable day. So I would hope that all of your students will have had a memorable day, maybe their last birthday or when they went on for a way away for the weekend or holiday or something. And um, I need to crash on because of the time. But this lesson very much follows the steps which I've outlined here, these five steps and is very good practice um, for the students for the uh, spoken part um, of, of, any, of any exam. Um, so I already made the point that it's not massively difficult to imagine uh, tasks, activities, where the students are to speak at length about something and make that personal. More difficult is at the sharp end of teaching, where we are, have limited language, um, and we're in the controlled practice. Let me show you two simple gap fill activities, exercises, if you will. They are both from Matura textbooks. And 
they are both teaching the same thing, or teaching, practicing, testing, more like, the same thing, which is the difference between using uh, the present simple and the present continuous. So here's the first one. 10.3 seconds to do that. And here's the second one. The question, which one is best? The one on your left of your screen or the one on the right of your screen? Can you write left or right? Let's see what people say. Hello from Kielce. Left or right? Left. Thank you, Magda. OK, I'll take one as the answer. Correct answer. Um, left, of course. There we are. Yes. I mean, it's not difficult, but what you've got here. Oh, somebody said the right. It's not difficult to uh, see that what's going on in the left hand side is meaningful. Students are writing true sentences about themselves using either the affirmative or the negative form. And then there's a second part, which is ask each other questions. So they're also practicing the interrogative form. And these are what we call um, double whammy exercises. So the students, of course, have to look at the particular language point that we are worried about, in this case, the present simple and the present continuous. They have to think about that and they have to try and get it right or wrong. But then they have an opportunity to take their heads up from the book and actually interact because these are sentences that are meaningful. In the in the right hand um, exercise, oh sorry, in the right hand exercise, the first uh, 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 sentence, I don't understand this question. Well, that might not be true. We're asking the students to actually say untruths there. And then we've got Tess, who's Tess, and then we've got um, Maria, who's Maria. And if you look at that fifth one, it's not even a good example because you could say in English, Maria wears cool silver earrings, as in every day, or you could say Maria is wearing cool silver earrings today. OK, so it's not even a good language from the language perspective. It's not even a good exercise because it's ambiguous. Both are possible. So we need to pay attention even at this, as I said, controlled practice stage of a lesson. Pay attention to form, but also pay attention to meaning. And I'd like to show you now, briefly, some of the examples of this from Focus 4, so you get the idea of what we're doing. Here is um, a lesson from uh, Focus 4. Um, and this is actually a new section which we've brought into the new edition called Use of English. Uh, part of the feedback we had from the first edition was that teachers wanted some more um, sort of exam specific practice. You know, those nasty questions in the Matura paper uh, where the students are uh, asked to know in this particular case, for example, this is collocations. This is an area, um, phrasal verbs is another area. They're typical areas which, which Matura try and probe the students' knowledge. And so we have these rather nice um, sections now in the new edition, where we are specifically homing in on particular areas of difficulty um, at the exam thing. And we're doing, of course, typical exam questions. So here is an exam question, a, a multiple choice. It's a gap fill, um, and you have to put in the correct um, uh, collocate um, to make collocations. Obviously, this has all come from the book or from the previous context and the students have looked at this and we've got um for example in the first case dad says it's important to set high standards for yourself c number two my sister has a vivid Im imagination and draws incredible pictures number three the last film i saw was rubbish i was bitterly disappointed okay so the students are choosing the uh, correct collocate. 
But when they've done that, so when they've had their moment worrying about form, worrying about which is correct, then we can go back to them and we can say, well, which sentences are true for you? Does your dad think it's important to set high standards for yourself? Maybe you don't have a dad. I mean, that's, again, something you manage in the classroom. But the last film you saw, was it rubbish? Were you bit bitterly disappointed? Um, do you eat well and try to lead a healthy lifestyle? Number five. OK, so there's a way of writing this type of material where not only does it do a job of practicing and testing form, but it also is meaningful. And which sentences are true for you or make something true for you or make something one false and three true. These are very good ways of doing it. Another way is in this example. Here it's a vocabulary lesson um, and here we're focusing on some rather nice expressions. Of course, this is all from Focus 4, so the students are quite good here. We've got, you know, their B2, B2 plus level. So here are some rather nice idiomatic expressions for describing personality, to be full of yourself, to be larger than life, to be the life and soul of the party, to have a love of learning, to make somebody feel at ease. They're quite nice. So what we do here, is we get the students to complete some statements by using an appropriate um, activity, uh, sorry, using an appropriate expression to replace the underlined synonym. So in the first case, number one, and we're down here in the speaking uh, activity here, number one, it's up to teachers, not parents, to inspire and encourage a desire for knowledge. So what is it? Ah, a love of learning, okay? So it's up to teachers, not parents, to inspire and encourage a love of learning in children. Okay, and then they do the other ones. And at the end, we, we come back and we say, well, do you agree or disagree with these statements? Okay, how much do you agree with them? How much do you disagree with them? So there's a way of doing the same thing as, the, as I spoke, spoke about before, which is the true or false. Here, you're asking them to say, do you agree or disagree? So it's still bringing in personalization. It's still bringing in that moment of meaning into what is actually quite a controlled activity. So these are a couple of examples um, from the book. Um, in other cases, you can have a bit of fun uh, with, with students. It's not exactly personalization, but you can see how good their physical abilities are in this particular case. Now, this is um, a unit on good health. Um, it's actually quite funny. I quite love this. Uh, uh, where is it? This um, is a collection of a dozen uh, excuses that students have used uh, for not coming to school. Of course, all of your students have got a fantastic excuse at the moment. The government told them not to. I don't think that's in here. But we've got fantastic ones. I burnt my hand on the toaster. Um, I slipped on a coin and sprained my ankle. I fell out of bed and dislocated my shoulder. And one of the ones I like is my toe got stuck in the bath tap and it's broken. The toe, not the, not the tap. <laughs> oh, an even better one um, is uh, I broke my arm trying to catch a falling sandwich. Uh, that's uh, unusual. So. Uh, a bit of fun with the students, but obviously there's lots of very rich language here. This is a vocabulary lesson again. And uh, one of the areas we can uh, look, uh, look at in more detail is parts of the body. So um, as it's a high level, these are, these are quite um, much more advanced words uh, that the students might need to know. But we have a bit of fun with it in the classroom. And uh, we teach these words, uh, ankle, chin, elbow, spine, whatever. And then in the speaking activity here, the students are asked to test their partner's physical abilities. Now, we'll see how far we can go with this. But for example, can you touch your left ankle with your chin? Or can you touch your right cheek with your left shoulder? Uh, I certainly can't. Um, now, whether you get the students to actually do that, I would but I would do it if I knew my students were, were happy to do that sort of thing. But it's a bit of fun and it sees what the, what the students can, uh, and it's obviously using the language in a, in a sort of meaningful way. 
Um, another bit of fun in this particular lesson is thinking about uh, or expanding the students' uh, sort of collocations, you know? Um, so talking about injuries or minor ailments, um, which is this uh, second uh, area here. So focus on words injuries. Um, you can be bitten, oh, sorry. You can be bitten by a dog and a rat or a snake, but normally um, you can't be bitten by a snail. So the students have to identify the thing which looks wrong or which seems wrong in that list. I don't know if snails are particularly ferocious in Poland, uh, but I haven't been bitten by one. So they have to replace the word that doesn't belong with a word from the text. And in this case, it's an insect. So yes, you can be bitten by a dog, a rat, an insect, a snake. What about break? What can you break? Well, you can break your leg, you can break your thumb, you can break your toe. Can you break, you can break your heart, very good. I've got a, a heckler in the room here. Um, but you can't break your tongue, okay? This is very difficult. Um, so tongue would be incorrect and the students would find the correct answer in the, in, in, in the, in the lesson. So there are ways we try always to um, uh, appeal to students' sense of humor, as well as appealing to their personal knowledge, uh, their personal um, uh, situations, their experiences, et cetera. Uh, so it's another kind of way of, of making lessons uh, personal or personalized. And then of course, on a more serious vein, we can talk about um, uh, more important topics in the news, and this is particularly true um, at the moment. And this is the, uh, unit on uh, the environment in uh, focus four um, and here we are appealing to the students knowledge and general knowledge so in in terms of um, this particular exercise here did you know and it's very interesting um, I, I realize I'm, I'm going to have to finish very shortly um, but it's very interesting how uh, Sue and I were reflecting the other day when we first started writing uh, focus which was nearly eight, nine years ago, um, the last thing students wanted to talk about was the environment. It was like the boring lesson. Um, and, uh, you know, whenever you um, tried to infuse the students, right, today we're going to talk about green issues. There kind of would be a, a collective groan in the classroom. Uh, not again, not that. But uh, unbelievably, uh, and I think mainly because of this young lady, suddenly everything has changed um, and she has infused uh, the youth of today and uh, it's the, seemingly if it's anything like my children it's the only thing they want to talk about and uh, me as a father i'm useless because i keep putting uh, the plastic in the wrong bin i drive a car which uh, runs on diesel i mean uh, frankly uh, they, most of the time they want to shoot me because I'm just not um, conforming to what the, the, the new ways are. Um, and I sort of gratuitously decided to include this photograph, A, because it was at a very important conference which happened in Katowice, but also because the other celebrity, shall we say, uh, one of the other celebrities who um, talked at this conference is somebody who uh, we like to consider in Britain as a national treasure. And this is uh, Sir David Attenborough. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. And we have people at two ends of the, of the age spectrum here. Uh, Greta, I think, is 17, 16, 17. Um, David Attenborough is 93. And, uh, but he's been a broadcaster um, for um, many, many years. Um, and he's particularly been broadcasting on uh, the natural world. And some of you may be familiar with the more recent BBC series called Blue Planet or Planet Earth. Um, these I'm sure have been broadcast here in Poland. In fact, I know they have. And um, I wanted to, I wanted to note the use of the past there. I wanted to show you uh, a video um, which we have uh, based on, I think it's from Planet Earth. Um, it's a fantastic, there we are, that's reminding me that I have to show you a video. Sadly, for technical reasons, we are unable to show um, the video, 
um, but I urge you to, to, to get focus and to watch it. It's um, unit five in um, the third level of focus. And it's about these uh, chameleons who have, and it's okay, so the whole lesson is about natural world um, and the BBC video which accompanies it is, is, a, is a clip from one of these uh, planet worlds. And they're focusing in on hunting hunting, uh, prey, so there's a lot of very rich language there. And this particular predator, uh, the chameleon, um, which exists in the uh, Amazon rainforest, and has a tongue three times the length of its body. And I wish we could see it, but you'll have to just take my description for it, that it unleashes this tongue, which flies through the air and catches an insect or whatever its prey is, and then it wraps itself back up again and it eats the prey my words are not doing justice you must see the clip but i wanted to say that because um part of the uh, uh beauty and the richness of the new edition of focus are the bbc videos we've been very privileged to have access to them and i think they really enrich the course um, and of course we have material in the workbook uh which goes alongside these videos and helps the students to get as much out of them as they as they can so that's an important thing. And another part of the video that we have, we have several different videos, and I know these have been mentioned before in the introduction, but the other one I would just um, highlight is the vlogs. Um, these are uh, questions that are specific to the grammar of the particular units where a question is asked over and over again to different people in, um, in the street in London. And uh, it's really interesting and really fun, and you can get a lot of work out of it uh, in, in the classroom. So, I think my time is up. Um, I'm sorry it hasn't been as interactive as I would have liked it to be, um, but I would leave you uh, going back to the theme of this, which is personalization, with uh, some quotes from a lady called uh, Gertrude Moscovich, who is uh, uh, somebody who was very much the person to um, uh, not start the humanistic approach, I wouldn't say, but certainly very much at the beginning in the, in the 1970s. And she said these things. So I'll just put these up and leave them with you on the screen. So this was Gertrude Moscovich in um, 1978. Uh, and I think that sums up. Start with the students, don't start with the course book, and your lessons will be much richer. Thank you very much for listening to me, viewing me, and I leave you with uh, a bibliography. Uh, this is your homework, by the way, further reading here. Okay, thanks very much, bye-bye. <laughs>